you want to paint gorgeous watercolors that are neither too flat nor too detailed and you are in the late beginner to intermediate stages of your painting journey, this video is going to be immensely helpful to help you break the next level of skill. Hi, I'm Françoise. Welcome or welcome back to my channel. I'm going to share my three step system that you can use to make sure and achieve this in any painting and with any subject. This is what I've been doing for years and I'm teaching right now in my new masterclass for those who want to practice and see fast results. Well, this video here will reveal everything that you need to know to get started on your own. How you prepare for painting is the first stage you're going to have to go through to paint anything, including loose realism in watercolor. Some of the things in this video are going to sound sometimes cliche to you because you've heard it before. The difference here is we're going to talk about the why and the awareness around why to do a certain thing is often what helps you level up faster. For example, my first advice to you would be to keep the sketch simple. And while composition does not directly impact how loose or realistic your painting is going to be, it is going to help you get started in the best possible way and make the art visually pleasing. And to do that, it's important to make sure that the subject fits and the proportions are right while keeping the sketch simple, which means that we're not going to draw all the details. Whatever we can easily add with watercolor directly, we leave out. And that is a skill you'll develop over time. In this video, however, you'll see examples of things that I'm going to be adding later. Another thing you can do is also alter or skip anything to benefit your process. For example, I used several photos here because I loved this lighthouse, but I wanted to add a wave to it. I also didn't draw the ladders and all the detail to simplify and also avoid burdening this painting with unnecessary detail. And keep in mind that we can still choose to add the small things like these later if we change our minds. So in the beginning, if you're not sure, just stick to whatever feels comfortable in terms of the sketch and then you can still add some things later if you need to. A limited palette will help you paint loose realism. And I know you've heard that one a lot, but we don't always get why we should limit ourselves. And it can even be frustrating when all we want to do is just try a bunch of things. So in my experience, having a limited palette helps to avoid overwhelm and it contributes to keeping everything simple again. And I'm not saying that the painting will look simplistic at all, far from it but more colors might make it feel busy and all over the place because it is likely that with more colors, you will feel all over the place too, unless you're used to painting in this way and you're already very skilled. If you're not sure where to start with a limited palette, but you want to give it a go, just grab yellow, red, blue, and a dark color like a dark brown or black or gray and my sepia here as an example of a dark dark and you can really paint anything with colors that are close to the primary colors and one dark dark and i talk about this all the time in my other videos because nowadays i have a hard time using a bunch of colors that just stick to a few because it's just so much more convenient then to leverage color mixing for simplicity and harmony is going to be helpful for example here i'll use yellow and red together with sepia to create a golden color for the rocks rather than using sepia alone because that would take away from the freshness and dull the painting, make it feel heavier with such a dark color and nothing else where those rocks are. Now the next stage is going to be very important, if not the most important one of all. And taking a bunch of classes and practicing for me was the thing that moved the needle the most when it comes to mastering that stage. I didn't know about anything that I'm going to be sharing today it was all messy in my head and some of the things I wasn't even aware of. So I know that this will help you fast track your understanding of all of this. And I'm talking about the wet and wet technique. And that is a skill that you want to master. And for this, you need to practice a lot. And you'll notice that painting becomes super fun once you've got it. For example, Mastering this technique will help you learn to adapt to what to wet or not to wet. When you look at a photo, you'll know what to do. As a beginner, I used to separate my paintings in sections to break it down because it was too overwhelming to paint everything in one go. 
But even though this technique of painting section after section can look great, it also easily takes away from that loose feel watercolors convey. With time and learning to work with water and paint ratios, I got comfortable and I've learned to start the majority of my paintings wet and wet and paint 60 to 80% of a piece like this. And it will be the case with this one here. And the best is that I paint realistic watercolors. So you can see here how painting wet and wet is a huge part of adding realism to a painting. If painting wet and wet feels scary where you're right now, which I could understand because I used to feel that way, know that you can stop at any time and just wait for the painting to dry, wet it again, and then keep adding to it like I'm doing now. Don't get caught up into thinking that you need to get it in one layer of paint because someone instructed is just one layer or you saw someone like me do it on a video. I mean, you can do it in several layers if you need to. The thing here is to use paper that is sturdy and that can take several layers and a lot of water. And if so, then you're good to do it on your terms. That's why I always use 100% cotton cold pressed papers for all my paintings because they're sturdy. They take longer to dry once wet. I can do everything I want with them pretty much. And it's really helpful to paint loosely without stressing about drying lines and other little mishaps. But I'm going to give you more tips that I have to paint one in wet next. A thing to keep realistic paintings looking loose is to avoid contouring a subject. You can rework things later on dry anyways. Because when you contour something, the drying lines show and it makes that thing look a little bit too obvious and those lines to show very much. And it's actually going to happen to me here in this painting with a lighthouse, but it's light enough in the way that I'm doing it that I'll be able to conceal that later with thicker paints. There are also times when avoiding a part in the painting is better to make sure that the whites will stay white. There are two paintings in my masterclass that show just how I do that, but most of the time I teach how it's not necessary to avoid the subject and it's absolutely fine if some paint gets on it as it's going to dry very light anyways if you go by the rule of starting with diluted mixes of paint, which is actually one of these watercolor rules that I find is still like a big part of my painting style and a big part of why I managed to so that one I would advise you not to break. I find it helps to work on the painting as a whole and then adjust each part as you go. At first I remember finding it very intimidating to do this, but I learned to master watercolors. Then I started finding that this is the easiest and fastest and also most beautiful way to paint for me at least. So again, it all comes down to mastering the wet and wet technique. It's also very important to paint on the whole sheet to build a cohesive painting color and contrast wise. Keep in mind that the type of paper you use will play a part in letting you do this. The secret here will be to block in the main colors in the whole painting quickly to maintain the humidity everywhere in the same way. Then you want to increase the pigment ratio in your paint mixes as you go to match the fact the sheet keeps getting more and more dry. And of course you keep painting each part one after the other. You try and not leave one part untouched for a long time because then it will dry and it will make it difficult for you to paint. And I find that to paint on the whole sheet also helps to decide where to make adjustments, where to add or where to remove some things. And the cherry on top here is that it leaves you with a great base afterwards and there's almost no more to do and you know you're going to have that loose aspect showing in your painting at the end. Using a large round brush for less precision really helps to add this base I'm talking about. And I love using one or two round paint brushes that feel big enough for the size of paper that I'm working on. I find it also helps not to get caught up into painting too much detail right away. And it helps me paint fast so the paper doesn't dry on me. So to nail the wet and wet, it's really a combination of paper, also the paintbrush you use, and mostly you mastering the technique. Keeping in mind the paper really, really helps. Now using certain brush strokes is also really powerful to start adding realism and that's something that we often talk about in watercolor painting. 
And I noticed that when I combine adding pigment to making brush movements, like curvy strokes for clouds in a sky, for example, or like here, tapping the paintbrush on paper to suggest splashes of water, it really helps infuse realism into a soft and fuzzy way. And that's one of the ways that you can make a loose painting slightly realistic if that's your style and not even bother adding more detail if you want to keep it on the looser side. You will still get something that's slightly realistic. Another way is to play with paint consistency and contrast. It will benefit all styles and the more realistic you want to go, the more you'll use this technique. For example here, I lift paint in places to get some of the white of the paper back. This is a much better time to do it than attempt it later when everything's dry because it's going to look natural and no one would tell that you've done this and I actually find the crashing wave looks nicer here by doing it. So that's a way to increase the highlights here besides keeping paper white parts like I was careful to do from the start. Because keeping those paper white parts in a watercolor is always going to give a painting that glow that no other technique or medium could achieve. I also add pigment to my mixes on wet still to amp up contrast and start emphasizing some things. In this particular painting, for example, it's crucial to do this for the rocky parts to make that wave stand out all the more. Dark against light. That's why the rocks are so important here. It also builds depth and both contrast and depth contribute to adding realism. But keep in mind that this is still done on wet and we're getting the loose effect thanks to the fuzzy edges forming around the rocks and at the same time, they make that wave crashing against it so much more realistic. So that's the funny thing. Because we think that to build realism in a painting, we'd need to use just the wet on dry technique, but that is not true as you can see. A pro trick is to use a clean and damp paintbrush to pull the paint in places. It really helps soften some edges even more and also improve gradients, especially when dark colors and white paper parts meet. It makes the whole thing look more believable if that's your style of painting. Since there are so many more ways to paint loose realism and so many different styles out there, I personally like my paintings to look like the real thing and I find that very strong and harsh changes of color can be made more natural with this technique. Now to keep a great color harmony going, try and include your chosen colors all over the painting, even if it's just a touch. It will benefit all styles that aim at some realism. That's why here I've added a little bit of all the colors in the wave itself and on the lighthouse and it was easy to do because I only had a few. And a very important thing too that differentiates a flat painting from a realistic one is that whites aren't completely white everywhere. Some parts can be for extra freshness in the painting, as I mentioned before, but if you can make sure that others have a tad of color into them, this combo will work wonders on the final outcome. You can see now how this wave is almost finished, but I'm going to show you in the next wave how to add a wow effect to the whole painting with just a few strokes. And if you want to practice and learn my techniques in depth, remember you can join my masterclass and I'll add a link to it in the description of the video. It's not surprising that the wet on dry technique is one of the most popular watercolor techniques along with the wet and wet because with these two you can do anything and that's why we're going to talk about the techniques that I use on dry. Because with the wet on dry technique, we can layer more color on top of a loose base and build more realism. That's what I use it for. For example here, I'm using the negative painting technique. And look at how amazing this is to make the wave pop and shape it while bringing the lighthouse forward later. So as always, it is all about contrast. Even on dry, keep using water to soften some of the edges and try and use a blend of both hard and soft edges. This is really effective to keep a painting looking loose while building realism into it and I'm doing it on the waves with a clean and damp paintbrush right now. It brings definition to the piece while keeping it light and natural. So adding contrast through layering is great, but adding it through color is even better in cases. And it's the case here where the lighthouse now pops against the wave. 
Another reason why we need it to be patient with art, since most times, as you know, everything comes together towards the end. When I add a strong color like this one, I try and make sure to vary the ratio of paint and water so it's not like a block of color, but more like a gradient to avoid a cartoony look. Working on dry is an opportunity to leverage certain techniques, like the dry brush technique here. You can see it adds texture to this lighthouse in just a few quick strokes, and all of a sudden it becomes more realistic. The paintbrush you use also matters in this phase. That's why I like to switch to a brush with a fine tip because it's easier to paint detail. Another thing I just made up a term for is controlled sloppiness and approximation. I think it works very well in watercolor painting. It's the art of adding detail that makes the whole painting look great, but when you look at it up close, it looks messy. That's why I draw crooked lines that look nothing perfect. It is really a skill to learn it at first, but then it becomes fun and it changes a painting. If you're a perfectionist like I am, by the way, an easy way to wrap your head around how to do this is to paint lines that are going to be broken or thick in parts and thin in others, like I just did here, or to space things out unevenly, to make things crooked, just make it a little bit messy. So tell me in the comments if you're more on the messy side or the neat side when you paint, you can just comment messy or neat and we'll see which type of loose realism you are more of. So we saw that keeping paper white highlights, then layering and then adding vibrancy are all important, but adding shadows can be what makes your main subject pop the most. It's very obvious here on the lighthouse because it helps each part become more defined. Ideally, you want to keep it for last like I just did and don't be afraid to create some mud when you overlap colors onto one another. It's when several colors mix into something brownish. And here I'm already using brown so it's not through color mixing that I'm getting this, but you could think that I'm ruining that bright orange color in the lighthouse, which in the way that I view it, I'm just adding realism to it, making it less unnatural looking, more genuine. And I'm mentioning this because making mud is often seen as overworking, but I really don't think so, especially if it's done on purpose and in the parts of the painting that need this natural brown color to show, like it was the case in the wave and now in the lighthouse. So don't be afraid to embrace that. And if you take it one step at a time and practice, you'll know how to make the best use of it, I'm sure. I don't recommend to add white gouache in all paintings, nor do I do it anymore. I used to when I was a beginner, but sometimes it is fantastic, especially if you don't overdo it. In my masterclass, I teach other ways to add strong additions to a painting without white gouache and just watercolors. But overall, adding those touches, adding those highlights is a great way to finish a painting. So really don't skip that step of adding highlights. Here, the white gouache is great to make the lighter side pop against the dark background and also help the small details stand out more. And it's even better to create the splash effect around the wave. It really makes it look more natural and emphasizes its movement. And by the way, this is also an example of leveraging splatters, another watercolor technique, to add realism. So I hope this was very informative. I spent time gathering this data from my masterclass. And if you want to practice that in depth, I'll link a presentation of it right here so you can watch next and take a look at the seven paintings that I teach in it and also learn more about what's included with the masterclass. So thank you so much for watching and see you next time.